Good morning again. Uh, thank you for joining session four of the Indiana Corn and Soybean Forum. Uh, we've, uh, as you know, we've spread out our forum, uh, the sessions throughout the week, and this is session four, and we're going to be uh, talking about grain markets and the grain indemnity uh, program. Uh, today, we're going to be joined by uh, Amy Cornell, president of the Agribusiness Council of Indiana, and Andy Tower, uh, director of public policy for the Indiana Farm Bureau. And then we're going to hear a market update from our own Ed Ebert, senior director of grain market grain marketing and utilization for uh, the Soybean Alliance and the uh, Corn Marketing Council. And then we'll, uh, Ed and I will close it up and uh, let you on, get on with your day. And we can't do this work without our, without our sponsors and without our members. And uh, this week, I wanna thank First Farmers Bank and Trust and Bain Welker uh, for their sponsorship of this week's forum. So let's uh, just get right into the program. Um, we call that we, I guess we call this a grain buyers panel. Now, just so you're clear, uh, the three of us are not grain buyers. Uh, we're lobbyists. Uh, we work on you know, your behalf. Uh, Amy is the uh, president of the Agribusiness Council of Indiana, and Andy, of course, many of you know, uh, uh, spent uh, several years here with us handling livestock issues. And uh, we really hated to see Andy leave, but we're glad he's at uh, Farm Bureau. Uh, he and I are working very well together. And it's just, uh, like I said, good to have him there. It's hated to see him leave, uh, but um, uh, glad he stayed in the uh, Ag family and glad he's at Farm Bureau. So I've been working very, very closely with him uh, in his role at Farm Bureau. But Amy, you're the president of uh, the Agribusiness Council of Indiana. Now, did you have to win the popular vote or was there electoral college you had to get through? <laughs> Uh, I had to get through an interview uh, gauntlet hiring process. <laughs> so no campaigning, really. No, no campaigning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just want to talk about the, uh, uh, the grain indemnity uh, program just briefly. There's the, uh, you know, the grain, the, the agency was created back in 75, I believe, uh, just to provide the licensing and the oversight of that. And then the Grain Indemnity Fund came in in 1995 to provide coverage in the event of a grain failure. And uh, now there are some legislators uh, that uh, are wanting to make improvements to that, um, to that law. And fortunately, they did reach out to the, to the ag uh, groups uh, to discuss you know, what improvements should be made. And uh, I know Amy and Andy and uh, and others, but Amy and Andy in particular, have really been leading that discussion with the, with the legislators to find out what their needs are, uh, provide some uh, input to a draft legislation. And again, uh, you know, this is a time of year where, you know, they're drafting legislation. It goes to the Legislative Services Agency, and then we get a final draft uh, back. Um, and a lot of times, you know, maybe some things get missed or some mistakes made and, uh, then we have to work through committee to, uh, to get the language right and uh, considering all the stakeholders. So it is uh, quite a process, and, but that's what we're here for. Uh, we, we, uh, we go through that detail so members don't have to, uh, but we wanna raise the awareness that there are gonna be some changes proposed. Uh, you never know until you get through the, the process until the final bill is passed, you know, what all those changes are. Uh, but we want to just kind of raise the awareness that uh, those discussions will be going on. Uh, we will be reaching out to members to make contact uh, with um, uh, with their legislators uh, to get the um, uh, to, you know to get this get this pushed across. So uh, do we advance the slide here? We got uh, just a few bullet points. We're just going to go through. Uh, and just have a conversation. We don't want so much a presentation, uh, but if uh, Amy, Andy, I'll just have you weigh in on, on these. One proposal is to require a third party actuarial study uh, of the fund. Uh, Andy, thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised that there, there, there's not an actuarial study, uh, but just your thoughts on, on, on that. So I think, you know, one of the things that that the legislators ha have looked at. I mean, we've seen quite a bit of consolidation across the overall, overall ag space over the last several years. 
And, you know, that coupled with the size of, you know, some of the private ethanol companies and, and some of these elevators, just wanted to be able to go in and, and stress test the fund to make sure that, you know, the investment that our farmers have made into the fund uh, during the, the couple different collection periods, that there's enough there uh, if we had a ca catastrophic type failure or if we had multiple failures in a given period of time. So I think, it, again, this is really, I think, an opportunity to look to make sure that there's adequate coverage to protect the farmers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amy, thoughts? There's, yeah, there's not a lot that I can add to that. Um, I think that, you know, that is, um, it, it, it's a good idea, right? To sit down and study, to look at the overall potential risk in the market, um, we do have Indiana compared to states across the nation. We have one of the uh, largest indemnity funds. It's, it's the best funded. And so, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should just sit back and take that for face value. It's always good to have data behind the numbers so that we know that we truly are um, adequately covering risk. And I yeah, guess, I'm, I guess I'm surprised that some, some major grain states don't even have a fund. But uh, yeah, so we're right. very fortunate to have that here in Indiana. Yes. Yeah. And it, I think, too, I mean, I think this notion of looking at every five years, I mean, you know, gives us a time we can look at it today, see how the, the industry continues to shape up. And then but it's but if they if it gets past the way uh, they're talking, it's in there. And so every five years it trigger that. And so it's not something that we would have to be coming back and asking for that or they would have to be coming back and asking for it. So I think that's. I mean, pretty thoughtful to, to put it in there on a, a reoccurring basis. Mm -hmm. So similar to a, you know, an actuarial study, but a performance review of the, um, of the agency. Uh, Amy, thoughts? Uh, just as far as, you know, it just seems like it's a healthy business, good government, uh, just to do a performance review. Are you getting, you know, meeting the metrics that are set out? Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that it's always good to have a set of outside eyes coming in. I mean, that's not necessarily, um, it's maybe not a common practice for government, but that's something that we do in business every day where we hire a consultant or have somebody come in and uh, just double check and give us an idea of other eyes, and especially when you are in something and you live it, breathe it every day, it can be good to have a, a second party come in and give you some new ideas or um, some tools towards efficiency and things like that. Now, any, any additional thoughts, Amy? So it's so not, not a whole lot to add there, but I think the other thing too, that this provides an opportunity, you know, as you think about the, the licensed elevators across the state of Indiana, I have got to assume we've got some that are very sophisticated using the, the latest, greatest software technology to, to manage their books. And then we have some others on the other end of the spectrum that are probably still using some handwritten ledgers and handwritten tickets. And so, you know, it's really hard for the agency as they go about their business to, to be able to cover the gamut. And I think having a third party come in and maybe provide some additional insights and, and ideas about uh, tools that they might be able to use to be able to spread that divide. Yep. Yeah, always key to any uh, great idea is how we're going to pay for it. So the, you know, some some language will be included to provide funding uh, to 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 do the actuarial study, to do the performance review, and also to provide uh, ongoing training for staff. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, you know, things always change. You got to, you know, no matter what. Uh, what industry you're in, things are changing. You got to get training. Uh, no matter how long you've been in a job, the training is is vital to keeping up uh, with those changes. Um, and of course, we want it, uh, that training to be relevant to um, you know the the activities that are needed there at the agency. Um, thoughts on the on the funding of that? Is that a you know this is a budget year, but we all know that. Uh, Anytime in Indiana, we want to talk about additional funds. Whether there's, uh, you better have a really good argument and uh, lay out clearly, you know how that's going to be paid for. But uh, given the uh, maybe the, you know the situation we're in with the uh, with state government concerns about uh, the about about revenue. Uh, now this is separate. Now uh, thoughts on that as far as how how does that 
How is this different than an ask of the general fund? So, so, so go ahead, Andy. So I think you're you're exactly right, Steve. I mean, it is a budget session. So I think first and foremost, we we as the ag industry need to, to be there to help hold the line on the on the general funding to the agency uh, because that I mean it is a challenging budget year for, for state government in general. So I think a number one, we want to be there to, to hold the line and, and be able to kind of you know make sure they don't lose funding. I think one of the other things that in speaking with some of the legislators is getting creative and finding other opportunities for additional funding into um, into the agency. Uh, as you as was mentioned earlier, I mean Indiana does have the largest fund, um, and that fund also generates a lot of interest over time. And so I think that's one of the things is there is there an opportunity to look at maybe some of that interest funding and being able to allow the Grain Indemnity Corporation Board to allocate parts of that uh, interest funding to provide uh, for the training and, and other resources. Um, so I think they're, I mean, again, trying to get creative uh, because we know that uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of extra money running around in the state budget this year. Yeah, I, that's, that's a really great point, Andy. And Steve, if I could just add just some clarification here, um, because when people hear the term audit, I think there may be some, you know, visions that come to mind about what that means. And what the, what the agency is really coming in and doing is taking a financial uh, snapshot in time about where that grain business is. Uh, in how some additional training could help provide them some insight is to present the overall bigger picture so that when they are out there collecting this information, they have a better understanding of just in general uh, how grain merchandising works, the cyclical agriculture of, of, um, of agriculture, the um, some red flags and different things so that they have uh, some additional background to put that financial snapshot in time into. Um, and I think that's something that the agency has pursued and looked at for some time, but funding for to provide those services has been a real constraint. So the idea that everyone got around the table to look at some creative ways that we could make this happen, uh, particularly in a tough budget year, I think is a testament to all of the ag agencies working together um, and getting some feedback with the agency about some tools that they think that they need to take these um, audits and this you know, financial check-in to the next level. Okay, and Rachel just told me that we have a question related to this slide. So Rachel, if you wanna ask that question, just a reminder, I think I may have uh, failed to mention that uh, there is uh, the option to ask ask questions of the panelists. Uh, so if you do have any questions, uh, we may not be able to get to all of them. Uh, if if not, we'll, you know after the after the program we will respond, um, and we're always always willing to talk about this issue. But you know there may not be time to cover everything in the in the program. Mm -hmm. So Rachel, what's a question that we have related to this slide? Yeah, absolutely. The Q&A is open for anyone who wants to submit a question. Uh, the question that I have received for this slide in particular uh, references the abbreviations IGIC and IGWBL. Uh, what is the difference? Are they the same thing? Um, can you provide just a little more background info? Uh, the Indiana Grain Buyers and Warehouse Licensing Agency. Uh, so when we're discussing this kind of amongst the group, uh, when we say agency, uh, that, you know, that's the, the group that issues the license. Um, and then if, uh, again, we probably have another acronym, the, the IGEC, the Indiana Grain Indemnity Corporation. Uh, a lot of times, you know, at least I do anyway, I'll say IGEC if I'm referring to the board, uh, but that's the, uh, that's the corporation that manages the fund. Is that clear enough, Amy and Andy? Yeah, I think so. And uh, it's easy to get these confused because these entities do work hand in hand, uh, but they are very separate and very different. The agency is a part of the administration. The IGIC board is a corporate body politic um, that primarily the, uh, their responsibility is over the indemnity fund itself. Um, and then working with the agency to maintain the fiduciary duty and integrity of the indemnity fund, whereas the agency has the responsibility for overseeing 
um, and auditing to maintain the financial integrity of the grain industry. Yeah, just as a reminder that that board is made up of farmers and uh, grain uh, grain companies uh, that and and bank have, bank banks have representation too. Uh, so those are the you know the industry experts that understand the business. Well, and Steve, I think it's probably important to note really the the organizations that are represented here on the panel uh, cover the vast majority of the farmers on that sit on that board of directors, as well as uh, I believe Indiana Farmers Union has a has a farmer representative to that board. Yeah, yeah, ACI has representation, corn soy have representation, as well as Farm Bureau and like you said, the banking and uh, farmers union. Next slide, please. Uh, one one idea is to get uh, increase that communication transparency. As Amy said, those are two very separate entities. Uh, they do uh, work together, but to uh, improve that uh, that communication and transparency. Um, again, what we're looking at are improvements uh, uh, to the to the law. So, uh, thoughts, Amy, or let's just start with Amy. Any thoughts on that? Just. Uh, yeah, so this is an idea that has been percolating for some time. Folks have talked about it uh, for a number of years is, you know, how can we leverage the IGIC board um, to also provide some advice and guidance, almost serve as like an advisory committee uh, to the agency. Um, and uh, it, although the idea has been talked about for some time, that wasn't the statutory mission of the, um, the, of the IGIC board when it was set up. And so that's why maybe we haven't seen as much of the communication and transparency as we wanted to. So when we actually went in and looked at the law, we realized that there may need to be some changes in the statute in order to see uh, that communication take place. Um, the key points that I think that the IGIC board really wants to see is just to have a better um, idea of uh, you know, a number of licensees that are in trouble, the potential risk to the fund that is presented and a potential number of claimants. And that kind of gives them a better overall picture so that they understand the potential liability um, that may be out there, the potential claims against the fund, so that they can give the agency some guidance on um, the overall mm -hmm. pace and tone of enforcement actions. Um, so that you, there's just better communication and they can, and the IGIC board can better protect the fund. Yeah, it's very important to point out that the, uh, the statute that they operate under doesn't provide for that. And right. that's what we're bound by. We got to, you know, we're a nation of laws. If it's, if that's the law, that's what you have to stick to. You, even if it's a great idea, it's got to be in the law before you can do it. Andy, any follow-up thoughts? Yeah. So I think just the, the one additional comment would, I would have is, you know, as we've mentioned, I mean, there's some really um, astute farmers and industry professionals that sit on that IGIC board. And so creating the opportunity for the agency to tap into that knowledge base, um, because th those are the ones that are really boots on the ground uh, from a farmer side, watching these markets from the grain uh, buyer side, the, the elevators, I mean, they're, they're in there trading every day. And then you got the bankers over there that are kind of watching the store for all of them. And so being able to leverage that knowledge and help, and help um, you know, lift up some of the agency's awareness of, of issues out there and to be able to have that free flow of communication back and forth, I think at the end of the day does nothing but further protect the farmer's um, delivery of grain into these elevators. Yeah, and this uh, kind of leads into our next next point here. Uh, you know, we do have those experts, and it's great that they're in the business. The you know they know that they understand the day to day what's happening right now. Uh, but we always have to protect against you know, any conflict of interest. Uh, so we're uh, one idea is to clearly identify that, strengthen that uh, um, that understanding of where there is a conflict of interest and how to deal with that. So. Um, uh, thoughts, Andy? No, I think this, I mean, this is vitally important to the role that the uh, IGIC board uh, does because uh, we do have, you know, competing business interests that sit around that table. And so 
there could be a case, um, you know, that if there wasn't a clearly defined conflict interest and in how those are going to be handled, that somebody might get some um, some information that could, you know, really sway or, or put another um, facility in, in a bad financial position. So, I mean, this is very important, I think, to all of us because, you know, even as as elevators and, and entities might have a challenge here or there along the way, we don't want to exacerbate that by having somebody go out and make a run on, on you know, on a facility. So I think this is, this is very important, um, you know, just for the overall integrity of the fund and, and the work that the agency does. Yeah, it's, it's just inherent with having experts in the room and you're gonna be, um, you're gonna just have that challenge to address and we wanna to, want to do that with this, uh, with this legislation. So next slide, please. Provide more awareness of licensees exposure to grain that is uh, deferred pricing. Uh, Andy, I'll let you start with this one. Uh, again, these are proposals. Uh, yeah. Remember, we don't know how this thing will flush out, but this is an idea, a thought that some some have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just, so to, to Steve's point, I mean, this is, I mean, these are proposals that legislators have floated out there that uh, we've been privy to those conversations. And I think one of the things that <clears throat> that brings this to the table is um, if you look back in history and some of the challenges uh, that elevators have had, have had, it is some of it has stemmed from the volume of deferred pricing grain that they've had on their books. And you know, as we, <clears throat> as you as farmers and, and others in the industry have watched, you know, some of the the movement in the market this year, especially going into harvest. If somebody had some deferred pricing grain on the books that was delivered, say in the spring, and decided to come in right now, um, you know that could potentially put some elevators at an exposure. And so, wanted to kind of take a look at that as you know, and give the and kind of call it out for the agency as they do their 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 reviews and checks to be able to you know let's take a look at that and and is there has this created some an, an increased exposure. Amy? Yeah, I think also um, that there is, there's been a push and there's always been a push uh, back to, you know, the days when I sat in a seat similar to, uh, you know, the seats that uh, Andy is sitting in now uh, at working at Farm Bureau is also raising awareness within the farming community so that folks understand you wake up today, but that's a law exists now. Uh, coverage goes back a set number of months in time, right? And what are some tools, what are some ways that we can make sure that uh, folks continue to remain aware um, of that coverage, uh, that we're making sure that um, grain companies are engaging in, you know, the best deferred pricing models, that they're making sure that their risk is uh, in proportion to, you know, overall best business practices. Um, and, and as Andy alluded, I think the focus is here because it, this tool has been a um, matter of conversation in a number of more recent failures. And so it, it is worth an additional look. It is worth additional discussion. I think it's going to take a number of weeks before we know exactly where the General Assembly is going to end up on this and what exactly this bullet means. Because right now there's just so many ideas floating, it's a little hard to dial in on um, how they see this actually playing out in the industry. But it's another good time to say the collaboration amongst all the ag organizations and the legislators that are interested in this has been really, really great. Um, and those conversations are going to make sure that the best ideas are going to move forward. Yeah, and I, again, just stress, we're still in the sausage making stage, not the sausage frying or eating stage. So <laughs> it's going to be a while. Uh, so it's, you know, you're going to hear things. Uh, we hear a lot of things. And then sometimes they, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, everybody can get around, but uh, you might hear a proposal, then we all have to talk and it's a game of compromise. I don't want to say it's a game. It's just a process of compromise. Yeah. Uh, that's how our system works. Everybody kind of airs out what uh, what their thoughts are and and uh, build some consensus. So you know, we're still in that 
that process where ideas are bubbling up, uh, even though we've been at this for a few months now, uh, but uh, you know, we're just continuing to work through that process. Rachel, I believe we do have a question uh, related to this. Actually, we've got a bunch of questions, so you guys just let me know when you're ready to move into a general. Uh, should we cover the final point and then just handle yeah. the Q&A? Let's do that. Uh, uh, give the um, uh, give the agency more opportunities to work with licensees that are in financial trouble. Now, that's easier said than done. Uh, again, we're just, this is an idea. We don't the mechanics of that. We got to be really careful. Uh, anybody that's ever paid attention to legislation, it's always those unintended consequences. We got to we've got to think through all the what ifs because um, we don't want to put in. Uh, too much burden on the agency. We don't want to put too much burden on the, uh, the, the grain elevators that are buying our products. Uh, it's going to have to be something workable uh, and, and then something that's going to address a concern that we have, not just uh, additional work that everybody has to comply. Uh, so uh, give me some thoughts on that, Andy. I know that, again, you know, that, that, that's a point that, we've, that needs a lot more work as far as what that really means. Like I said, easier said than done. Uh, now I'm not saying it can't be done, uh, but just given the limits of the agency and um, you know, we don't, like I said, we don't want to burden the grain buyers, but, but just right. some thoughts there on that point, Andy. Yeah, you're exactly right, Steve. There's a whole lot, um, a whole lot of different ways this could go and a lot of work yet to be done. But I think, you know, the premise behind this is <clears throat> to give the agency some additional tools in their toolbox to be able to work with an elevator um, that might be in a, in a short time situation where they're struggling, they can't meet some of those statutory requirements. Um, because currently there's not a whole lot of wiggle room for the agency. I mean, it, they pretty well, you know, have go from zero to hundred as far as what they can, their options for working with an elevator. Um, and so it's just, you know, really trying to sit down with the agency as well and understand what those tools that they do need, um, as well as, you know, talking to some of the folks in the industry that, that understand, you know, these grain transactions and where are there are other opportunities to work and work through the process so we don't have a failure. Because at the end of the day, I think, you know, if we haven't said it, I think that's the goal of all of our organizations working through this. We don't want to have failures. We want to make sure the farmer's investments are protected, but we want to make sure the agency has tools at their disposal that they can do those things effectively as, as things continue to move forward. Amy? Yeah, so if I could just jump in here and say, um, that's true, we don't want to have failures, uh, but I think it's also important that the license that the uh, grain buyers hold maintain, main, is, uh, maintains its financial integrity, right? So we don't want to go too far where we're boxing ourselves into a position where we're asking the agency to continue to prop up a business that maybe, frankly, shouldn't be in business, right? It, because we want the license to hold integrity for the farmers, for the grain buyers uh, that are trading with each other and others. So that's why this last bullet um, becomes really tricky. And you know, other conversations become tricky. Um, agency discretion in these cases um, is really important. There are, if you look at any business, they, uh, especially in agriculture, because it's cyclical, there are certain periods of the year where if you're going in to take a financial snapshot in time, the books may not look real pretty just on a financial snapshot. You have to be able to step back and look at the overall big picture. So there's a difference between a, a minimum net worth ratio that's out of whack because there's a genuine cash flow problem versus you came in on the day when the, the company just happened to make the big equipment investment or uh, a big debt payment or something like that. So I think if we take a step back and look at it from a business perspective, we can understand that there's different scenarios. Um, but what this bullet is really saying, and I think even though we don't know exactly how it's gonna play out yet, the message that we're trying to send to everybody right now, agribusinesses and farmers is, there may be a change in the way that the agency is going to come in and regulate 
um, and manage the industry. And so you may see them use different tools uh, after this law passes that we haven't seen before um, in the communication uh, back and forth and just making sure that we're not accidentally tipping a business over the edge while we're trying to help them, I think is going to be really important um, as we continue to move through these uh, conversations. Agree. Uh, Rachel, yep. let's uh, move right into the the questions that we have. Okay, first question, uh, kind of a foundational question. Who is on the board? So um, from Indiana Farm Bureau, um, President Randy Crone sits on there and Kevin Underwood uh, represent um, Indiana Farm Bureau. Um, I believe what Mike Bias is on the board, <clears throat> and Steve, I'll let you talk about the corn. Yeah, soy Jim, Jim Douglas represents the, the Soybean Alliance, and David Howell uh, represents the uh, Corn Marketing Council. And Amy, I know you've got some representation. I'm not sure who the bankers are, but if go ahead, Amy. Yeah, um, so Agribusiness Council representatives include uh, Mike Silver from Kokomo Grain, Ron Reichart from Cargill, and Peter Schramm uh, with Beck Seeds. There are also two bankers, um, and the IGIC board is chaired by the current Grain Buyers uh, Director, Harry Wilma. Okay, thank you. Next mm -hmm. question. The U.S. Warehouse Act uh, needs to be considered as well. How are the federal authorities being considered? Um, that wouldn't be anything we would uh, consider as far as the formulation of the, the legislation. I mean, it's good to be aware of what, but not every, not every grain buyers uh, under, under the federal authority. So Amy, I, you help me out there. The yeah, that's that's accurate. So um, okay. there are there's state licensing and there's federal licensing. Um, they do work hand in hand. The 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 um, the the state agency is focused on the state licensing, uh, and they do carry different um, different penalties. So it's important, you know, to know which um, which like what license a grain buyer holds. Um, because the, the ramifications can potentially be different. Next question. The majority of our grain is sold out of state. Are we covered? Uh, it has to be an Indiana licensed uh, facility. So the, if you are selling grain out of state, you may be covered under another state's program. Now, is that something that um, uh, that Harry would be able to answer, or do they need to go to the to that state's um, state government and find out what what coverage they may have? What's the uh, or is there Andy? Do you know of information that's gathered on that? I know Jeff Cummins with your office has done some research on what is offered, but what's the best way for a producer to know that they're covered in another state? So we've done just a little bit of research here, uh, as you'd mentioned, but I, I would re highly recommend that the producer reach out to that state to figure out, to understand what the coverage um, they may or may not have uh, with some of those deliveries. Yeah, so even if they do have a, they do have a program, there may be some nuances there that they may or may not be covered. So it's good, good practice for them to reach out, find out under their circumstances, do they have coverage and what is it? Next question, please. Uh, how does the fund get funded and how much money is in the fund right now? Uh, the fund, there's a, uh, I can't remember the, is it, help me out here, Amy. <laughs> I know that you've studied this a little more than I have, but there's there's a percent that you, you pay during a collection. <clears throat> And once yeah. the fund gets to a certain level, then those collections cease. And then that, that money is just held and builds interest. Uh, current level, the fund, I, I was on the IGIC uh, board meeting for a little bit uh, the other day, but I didn't catch uh, the financials. Uh, yeah. So you know that. If not, we can follow up on that question. 
Yeah, so there's only there in, to date, there have only been two collection periods in Indiana. It is a, uh, it is, they, a farmer pays in a fraction of a percentage on um, sold grain. And the current fund um, assets right now are just over 36 million. And, and I think it'd be noted that it would, it's been two years, two and a half years since there was a collection when the last collection closed. So it's, um, Next question. Does the grain fund have a super priority lien in the Indiana state statute such that they have the first right to the assets to make sure the farmers get paid before secured creditors like other states do? Uh, this puts the auditing value more on the banks who are experts in this area. So the, the agency does have the ability to come in and take um, priority liens. Uh, one example of that would be a, for a failure that happened a number of years ago. Um, it was an entity that also had livestock um, and the agency was able to come in and take uh, ownership of that livestock, um, you know, liquidate that herd and then use some of those proceeds to go into um, the compensation. So, but I would say that it is nuanced um, and I wouldn't, it, it, it would be an overgeneralization to automatically assume that the grain buyers agency would have a super priority lien on everything. I'm sure there's some exceptions in there. We have more questions, Rachel. I am looking, I also uh, just saw a note that uh, IGIC's financials are available on the website. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any additional information you need, got uh, specific questions, particularly with your you know, any, any situation you may have, you just need to reach out directly uh, to the number that's on the screen here. Uh, thanks, Andy, Amy, really appreciate you setting in on this. Uh, we'll probably end up talking yet today about, about this issue as, as we do others. Uh, we work very closely <laughs> together where we can. Uh, it's been uh, it's been great to work with both of you. It's great to have you on here today. Uh, we are kind of losing our time here, so we're just going to uh, end this session. If you have questions, let me know. We we can respond. So thanks again, uh, Amy and Andy. Thank you. Thank you. So next, we're going to have uh, Ed Ebert give us a market update. Ed is our senior director of grain production and utilization. He had a career. Uh, at Bungie uh, prior to joining us and is very knowledgeable about about markets and uh, very fortunate to have him have him with us and uh, have uh, to get his perspective uh, today. I know there's been a lot of uh, a lot of action in the markets over the past few months and Ed give us uh, give us your thoughts on uh, what you see. Well thank you Steve and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, just a quick update on where futures markets are here today. March corn futures right now, we're trading at 425. That's up about one and a quarter cents. And we've got uh, March, excuse me, January soybean futures trading at 1164 and three quarters. So that's up almost 12 cents today. So pretty uh, positive day, at least so far here uh, in Chicago in terms of grain prices. Um, but certainly this uh, update is going to be a lot more less painful than the ones have been for the last three or four years for sure. Uh, so let's get right into it. So one of the questions that a lot of people have both inside the industry and, and outside of it are why are commodity prices in the ag sector so much higher this year? And it comes down to you know several different factors and we're going to go through most of those as we uh, walk through the balance sheets and uh, look at some of the global uh, aspects of what we do. But, you know, certainly record uh, export sales to global customers for virtually every commodity you'd want to talk about. Uh, and, and China's coming for wheat now as well. So, um, you know, corn, soybeans, uh, livestock products in the form of pork, beef, uh, et cetera, all of these have been just on um, um, historical uh, levels in terms of demand uh, from global customers. So, you know, certainly, um, you know, one of the reasons that we've had, you know, some issues here with overall demand globally 
Uh, obviously, there was, you know, the trade dispute with China obviously uh, puts a, a damper certainly on the soy complex. Uh, but one of the things that, that has really broken through this year that has been just a really um, um, market mover in terms of both uh, the demand uh, component and also in price has been what China has, has done this year. Now we're on the you know we're on the phase one trade agreement with them, and there are targets and and goals for them to meet for that that agreement. But certainly, what we've seen this year, particularly in the corn complex, has just been um, uh, significantly a better uh, outlook for corn this year, based on uh, principally what China has done so far. So again, um, we got these. Great and robust exports. We've got reduced outlook on U.S. production that really started clear back. You know, if you remember back to uh, the March uh, prospective plantings report, and then the big surprise the market got here at the end of June with the acreage report, uh, we've really been kind of on a downward trend in terms of both uh, overall production, uh, particularly on the corn side. Uh, soybeans uh, maybe a little less. Um, a uh, little less modified in terms of that original outlook that we had back in June WASD. But certainly uh, in, in the case of both of these, uh, the USDA has been helpful in terms of recognizing uh, both what September stocks meant to both corn and soybeans, and also uh, the estimates that um, USDA NAS puts out in terms of production. And then of course, WASD's overall supply and demand outlook. Um, we have partnerships here at both uh, Soybean Alliance and the Corn Marketing Council with global entities that push these export programs globally around the world. So we've got um, um, affiliation with the U.S. Grains Council, the U.S. Soybean Export Council. And again, these are creating these market opportunities around the world for corn, soybeans, and the associated products for both of these. You know, we also have partnerships with USA Poultry and Egg Export Council and the US Meat Export Federation to promote livestock, which is eating Indiana corn and consuming Indiana protein, again, to these global markets. So um, again, these, kind of, these kinds of relationships build this long-term um, um, cooperation we have between our countries. And certainly even during the height of the trade war, we will, were still working um, and visiting China, uh, you know, talking about you know, why US soy and, and why US farm products are so important to them for the quality, sustainable production, the food safety protocols that we have here in the US, USD uh, inspections, and of course, logistical execution. Because if you buy something and if you can't get it, um, you know, it, it's just the same thing as having not, not, not bought it. In addition to just supporting these organizations on this higher level, we also have cons, you know, country specific programming uh, with each of these uh, outside organizations. So we select areas uh, around the globe uh, based upon um, our interests in terms of what products and, and what, what, um, what export products we want to work into those markets. And we tailor our custom uh, make programming, uh, particularly in the livestock space, that really has an impact on Indiana businesses here within our state. And we also have these strong in-state in partnerships with Indiana Farm Bureau, uh, Indiana State Department of Agriculture, Indiana Pork, Beef, Dairy, and Poultry Associations, all of us working together again to make sure that we increase demand and, and again, a work to move that pile for our Indiana farmers. So both uh, corn and soybean checkoffs, we work with these entities all across the board virtually on a daily basis. So um, again, I think it's, um, it's important to recognize that, that it's not just about whole bean or whole corn uh, exports uh, in terms of what goes on here. It's also about the products that come from these uh, these, the commodities that we have here in the form of ethanol or DDGS, or in the case of soybeans with soybean uh, protein concentrates, soybean meal and soybean oil exports. So just quickly looking at our, our, our futures markets here, again, we're a little bit higher today. So uh, March corn futures have had a very, very nice run here since 
you know, we got into the first part of August and certainly the August uh, WASD and USDA NAS crop production report really started this off in terms of, of generating this interest uh, in terms of, of looking at building premiums into the corn market. So, you know, we continued on this run and certainly when you look at the US corn balance sheet, um, we have really gone from a, a situation back in June, and I've got a slide that highlights this, but we've gone from a, a situation in June that was going to have a record corn carry out to one now that is actually getting and feeling relatively tight uh, in terms of, of stocks to use and also in terms of just absolute bushels that are available to the marketplace. But certainly when you look at this, um, We've got the highest uh, estimated average farm price now since basically thir you know, uh, crop year 1314. So um, I think that's led to a lot of um, uh, uh, improvement in farmers' outlooks uh, and certainly the per Purdue Ag Barometer uh, along with the uh, uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange has certainly reflected that as well. But as we look at this, um, you know, everything that we see here today shows a balance sheet that still has some structural reasons to be functional. And when I mean functional, that, you know, price is really a big component of, of monitoring what's going on in terms of overall demand for corn here, both in the U.S. and globally as well. And as we look at uh, corn basis here in our state of ethanol plants, obviously we've gone through the traditional cycle of harvest um, uh, depreciation with a lot of corn moving at once to where we've seen this basis improvement at these ethanol plants here over the last uh, month or so now. And global corn, when we look at it, um, these are some triggers that, you know, you, you can be looking at as you watch these markets. Supply side is probably going to be pretty quiet on price until we get the U.S. Uh, crop production final report, which will be on January 12th uh, at noon here in the eastern uh, time zone. South American weather is not ideal, but still early to quantify what these implications are of production, especially on corn. A late start to the soybean planting has placed Sophrenia acres at production risk. And, and Sophrenia is basically the corn that gets planted right behind the soybeans when they harvest those. And so there's, there's a couple of issues that, that if you delay soybean plantings, you put that, that second crop corn in a window that is uh, much more um, harsh in terms of getting a uh, yield off of that, that corn as you go through that cycle. So Southern Brazil's already probably lost some of that yield potential because especially Mato Grosso has been really slow in terms of their overall planting progress on soybeans. Um, the USDA uh, December WASD usually has very few changes. You know, most of that's going to get held uh, for the January WASD, where you have both the crop production final from NAS, you've got the WASD report from the chief economist, and then you also have December one stocks that'll play into that report as well. And the only other thing globally that's kind of something to at least look for or be aware of is that you know, based on EIA uh, data in, in terms of their outlook for fuel demand, there is this potential for ethanol grind reductions here in the US, you know, and that would probably equate to something in the 50 to 60 million bushel range, but still places that carry out in a fairly tight position. So this is what I referred to just earlier here in terms of how this, this world that we live in has changed so much. You know, back in June, we were kind of emerging from you know, COVID lockdowns. We had big planted acreage uh, on the March uh, prospective plantings report. We had a big trend line yield. Production was almost 16 billion bushels and exports were only 2.1 billion bushels and carry out was this whopping 3.3 billion bushels. Now, if we look at the WASD that came out here um, back in November in the early second week, planted acres are down 6 million acres. Yield was down um, not quite three bushels per acre. Production was down significantly. Um, and that's based on harvested acres and also um, um, understanding that all, not all those planted acres get harvested for grain. So at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a combination of a lot of different uh, numbers that go into that, the ratio. 
uh, right around the August crop production report that occurred in Iowa and parts of Illinois, et cetera. But exports you know, just exploded here, uh, another half a billion bushels of, of exports. And of course the carryout was nearly cut in half based on just those changes. So you've got both this tremendous demand growth uh, coupled with also a declining supply based upon what that first look was you know, prior to uh, getting real objective data starting in August with the crop production reports. So jumping over to uh, soybeans, um, again, soybean futures, this doesn't reflect that uh, 11 cent up move here today, but again, show that same pattern in terms of, you know, you get to that August crop production report and suddenly the market starts recognizing that there's something going on here. And part of what we saw going on um, in, in this period of time in August was China was back in buying cargoes and lots of them. And of course that's continued you know, at just a you know, incredible pace as we move through the fall period. And when we look at what we would estimate, you know, China's going to need here prior to the arrival of South American production here sometime in late February into mid-March, uh, you're probably looking probably at another 500, you know, about another half million to a million tons of demand that hasn't yet been satisfied. So the, the reporting of Crop sales to China has definitely slowed down. I mean, you're not seeing, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand uh, ton sales being reported, you know, like you were there back in September, October, and and even in early parts of November. But there's still some there's still some activity that needs to happen, particularly with the delays in plantings that we saw down in South America. In the soybean balance sheet, um, you know, there, there's there's great news here. Um, when, you, when you go through, and, and I've got that same kind of sheet where we talk about how things really changed from June until now, you've gone from almost, a, you know, last year or in 18, 19, you had almost a billion bushels of carry out. And this year, just two crop years later, you know, projected carry out or estimated carry out at the end of this coming, this crop year that we're in right now is 190 million bushels. That is unbelievable in terms of you know, looking at, at, at really reducing those stocks here in our country. And most of that has to do with, you know, what was going on with this tremendous export business that we've seen this year. So globally, soy has this, this, this issue right now, which is kind of twofold. Big inverse and in futures price indicates a strong demand in the front end. So if you look at where futures prices are right now in soybeans, you get out past March and they're lower than they are today. And what that market is trying to tell, you know, the market's trying to signal, we want it now, not later. And as a consequence, um, we've seen pretty good farmer movement all the way through um, uh, the harvest period uh, and even people looking at it currently now. March crush margins are trading at 95 cents with oil share at 32 and a half percent. That oil share is high uh, based on what we see in terms of historical demand, um, and, and that's significant because that's kind of dislocating some things. And, and that's gonna come up in this next point, which is China crushing margins have been limited because the meal's not keeping up with that oil demand. So you're crushing um, for oil, which really depreciates the margins on the, on the meal side. And so that's, that's what's pressuring these margins in China. You probably looked at your own marketing advisory services or have heard this through, uh, the trade that, you know, well, what's up with China? Well, you know, there's, there were some reports of cancellations of cargoes, but these are, you know, not significant uh, by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Um, but again, it's something that we need to be a cognizant of in terms of what those margins look like in China. Lower Brazilian crop estimates, um, U.S. balance sheet's going to be tight, especially as we close in on March, April, and May, which is the traditional planting season for this upcoming year. And current corn to soybean returns favor soybean plantings today. And that's gonna be especially important when we get into setting uh, crop insurance prices here during the month of February. And again, these are the WASD changes. Um, not quite as significant as what we saw, although it's, you know, it's basically cut in half uh, from what we felt like we were going to see back in June. Um, again, production stayed relatively flat on soybeans, 
but exports obviously went 150 million uh, bushels higher. We also had a fairly significant impact on September 1 stocks that also plays into this carryout number. So again, um, it's, 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 it's been one of these years where USDA, NAS, and the WASD have actually been your friend this year. Okay, so on the quote screen, what do I watch right now? So what's the important part of what's going on in our market today? It's Brazilian weather. So I watch the forecast and then I watch what the radar actually shows me and I try and square those two uh, together to, to try and figure out what's going on here in terms of these markets today. One of the things that we do here uh, is, is, is work um, every year we have a lot of trade teams come through our state and visit farms and industries uh, here in our state, Purdue University, et cetera. So, um, so using the same technology today, we actually have done like 12 of these events already this year. And we had five teams in prior to the lockdowns of last year uh, due to COVID in March of, of 2020. So these are uh, great ways for us to uh, uh, showcase our farmers, uh, both our directors and other farmers um, about you know, the sustainability practices that we're, we're using on our farms, how we are carefully storing and selecting these uh, varieties uh, for use overseas, et cetera. And it's kind of interesting because we run the video, which is done ahead of time. And then the farmer and these industry partners are on to answer any of these questions. And then of course, uh, international folks are on there to make sure that we're getting the right uh, translation and clarifications of any questions. So here's what we see. Corn, commodity prices have significantly improved. You know, tell me something I don't know. Export sales have been stellar for ag products. These delayed plantings and uncertain uh, weather in South America have built risk premiums into the marketplace. There's no doubt about that. USDA has lowered crop production estimates for both corn and soybean crops throughout this growing season. Carryout stocks in both soybeans and corn are at multi-year lows, which again is why you're seeing this real tension in these balance sheets to be functional. And COVID spread, you know, threatens additional lockdown procedures, which would impact our, our domestic demand for sure. Global crush margins are under a little bit of pressure right now because we've got this dislocated element between meal and oil demand. So, um, before we say thank you and wrap this up here today, I will highlight the fact that the uh, Coronavirus Food Assistance Program 2 deadline is December 11th, 2020. And I would encourage you because in talking to one of our uh, board members the other day, he recently filled out his paperwork and he said, you know, you know Ed, we have to make sure farmers understand <laughs> that this is a big deal uh, in terms of uh, he was surprised uh, after he filled out his paperwork what that meant for his own operation. So I would encourage farmers to certainly, uh, if you haven't started or if you're kind of in the middle of it, you know, please get that stuff wrapped up here before December 11th. And with that, I'll turn it back to Steve. Well, thank you, Ed. And uh, Ed. thanks, Ed. And thanks for that reminder that uh, of all the work that uh, corn and soybean checkoff uh, programs, what the farmers have invested in these and developing these markets. Because uh, a lot of times, you know, customers don't just show up uh, when they need a product. They have to have those relationships, uh, those trade teams if, that uh, we've hosted and our farmers have hosted over the years. I mean, that, that's, that is paying off now. And I, uh, thanks for that reminder of all that work that our farmers have done and invested in is, is really paying off. And th uh, thanks for that perspective on what we should expect in the markets. Uh, Rachel, do we have any questions for Ed concerning his, his update? Prob uh, I don't have any in the chat right now, but I will let you know if some pop up. <laughs> okay, and I, yeah, Ed, it's a lot better, um, a lot better update than what you, uh, what we were hearing last summer, so. Uh, maybe that did put folks at ease and there's just not as much, uh, not, not as many questions for you, but uh, thanks for that thorough report. Uh, that concludes our, our program. Again, we cannot uh, do this, um, we cannot do this work without our members and uh, we, we'd love to have you as a member. We've got a, a joint uh, membership at $150. Uh, that, that gets you into to both organizations. 
Um, that, um, and it also allows you to be a member of American Soybean Association as well as uh, NCGA. Uh, that CFAP2 question, our um, program, uh, we had some questions from producers on that. Uh, we have NCGA staff right there in Washington to help uh, get some resolution to some of these issues. So that's what your membership is able to do. It to represent, you know, we can represent you here at the state level as well as at the national level more, uh, more broadly than what we're able to do here from Indiana. So any, um, any membership questions, just contact Rachel. And uh, I think that's that's all we need to go. Oh, one other thing, there is a new corn action app. Um, if uh, if you're a corn member, uh, uh, there is going to be a a new app. Uh, they they will send a, a, an email with your membership number. You'll have to close down the app, but reopen it uh, with your membership number. Uh, it's a great tool. Uh, it provides information on uh, your members of Congress. A lot of the NCGA action alerts that are going out, and some and some additional information. Uh, that it is a very good, uh, very good app. If you're a corn member, again, look Monday they'll be sending out information on how to restart that that app. And we're relaunching that. Uh, so with that, uh, tomorrow th this will wrap up uh, this week's forum. But we have Welker Farms joining us. Uh, we're going to have uh, Kevin Cox, our very own Kevin Cox, interview. Uh, Nick uh, Welker with Welker Farms. Uh, it's a really neat story about how they were able to uh, just use the uh, uh, videos of what they do on the farm and uh, create quite a following. It's really neat how they tell the modern ag story um, uh, to, to, to their followers. So uh, it's going to be a fun, uh, fun session. So look forward to seeing you there. Now you do have to register to be a part of that. If you registered for this session, but not tomorrow, you got to register for each session separately. So go to our website, make sure you're registered, and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And thanks again for joining us.